Well, our folk this morning did pretty well with the verse of the week, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 5. So let's see how tonight's crowd can do singing that, singing, saying that, I guess you could sing it if you want to, but supposedly we better say it, all right? Are you ready? And beside this giving, add to your faith virtue, all right, very good. Now go on to verse number six for next week, learning all of these virtues as they're called in this particular passage. Well, tonight we're going to study another of the men in the Bible. It's certainly exciting to read and study about these particular men. I suppose I get more benefit than you because I have to look and search and find things out about these men in the Bible. And so it's been a blessing to me to look at all the men we've studied, Old Testament men, now New Testament men. We're winding down all that we're going to be studying as far as men of the Bible real soon. But tonight we come to a man named Philip. Now you might say, Pastor, we already studied Philip. And you're correct. We studied Philip the apostle. Actually, there are four different Philips in the New Testament. This Philip is not the same as Philip the apostle. But we also find that the other particular Philips are found, well, one is called Philip the Tetrarch. He was a ruler of Judea and is mentioned in the Gospel of Luke chapter 3 verse 1. Another Philip was the son of Herod the Great, and he's mentioned in Matthew 14, 3 and Luke 3, 19. Just like many of these names, many people had them. Today, you have a lot of James, you have a lot of Johns, you have a lot of Marys, and so on, you know. A lot of people have the same names. And so back in that day and time, a number of people did, and in the Bible, those four men uh, had the name Philip. Our Philip tonight, we first meet over in Acts chapter number 6. In Acts chapter number 6. And as we see this man, I believe we could title his life with Lover of Men. Philip had a great love for others. And we'll see that this evening as we take a look at his life. We first meet him in Acts chapter 6. If you remember the context of this, the apostles were very busy with the church at Jerusalem, the very first church. The church at Jerusalem was growing by leaps and bounds. The day of Pentecost, 3,000 added to the church. A couple chapters later, 5,000 added to the church. And then it says in Acts 2.42, the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. And so this church was growing. The apostles were trying to meet the needs of all the various people in the congregation. And a number of that group of people were widows. And it was just hard for them to minister to all the widows who needed spatial attention and give themselves to the study of the word and the propagation of the gospel. So they felt impressed to ask this church to choose out seven men to head up this ministry to the widows. That was their first thing, a ministry of helps to help the widows in this church. And the church chose seven men. We find their names are given to us beginning in verse 5. The saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, we studied him just a couple weeks ago, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. And here he is, and Philip. And, of course, it mentions here the others, Procurus and Nicanor and Timon and Parmenius and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. So their names are all given to us here, but here's Philip. So we first meet Philip, and we find out that Philip here was one of these men who were chosen by the church at Jerusalem to be what we call the first deacons. The first deacons. Deacon just means servant, diakonos in the Greek. So deacons are servants of the Lord and the church. Here's the first particular seven that are chosen here. Now, 
we find these men are chosen to deal with widows. So we find, first of all, with regards to Philip, he's a man that's interested in helping any type of people, including these older women who had need of help. And you know, that's remarkable. He probably was not too old a man. And so often we find that younger people don't have a lot of time for older people. They're too busy in their lives. They're too busy with activities. And a lot of them just don't have much time for those who are older. But you know what? There's a real ministry there. Older people need the attention of younger people. First of all, whenever a young person comes up and talks to someone that's older, it kind of makes you feel good. They're interested in me. They haven't forgotten me. I'm not cast aside. Why, it's wonderful that they're interested in me. There was a young man in this church years ago, many years ago, and some folk will probably know who I'm talking about, but this young man just loved to meet older people. He went around, shook hands with them, talked to them, just made them feel wonderful all the time. It's just something that he did a lot of, just was outgoing and loved to talk to the older people and sometimes would make such an impression upon them that they really loved him. They really appreciated him. So teenagers back there, pick you out an old person here tonight. Go to them and make their day. Now I'm teasing them a little bit, but... Honestly, you can. I'll tell you, years ago when we ministered at what was the Fontana Nursing Home in town, our children were real young. When we go to that nursing home and march into that room with all of our little children, people's eyes got big and big smiles. Man, were they happy to see them. And this really made their day when after the service, we had them go around and speak to the people in that service. Oh my, they never got over that. If I ever went to a service there and didn't have my children, Pastor Gretton, where's the kids? They missed them. They really missed them. It did a lot for those folk. So you know, Younger people don't forget the older people. By the way, a lot of them have a lot of wisdom too. You could learn a thing or two from some of the older people if you'd sit down and talk to them and find things out about them there. It can be beneficial to your own life. But here Philip was interested in helping these elderly ladies and gave them himself to minister to them so the apostles would be free in order to minister the word of God to others. I think undoubtedly this man also in verse 5 would have been just like Stephen, a man who was full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. All these men were men of faith, men of the Holy Ghost. Men of faith are men of the word because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. They wanted to know the word and thus they would know the Lord. So they were very much into learning the faith and growing in the faith. Full of the Holy Ghost just means letting the Holy Spirit control your life. We're all supposed to do that. Ephesians 5.18, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Paul wrote that to all the Ephesian believers and all to us. Being filled with the Spirit just means having the Holy Spirit of God in charge of your life. He'll be in charge of your life if you ask him to. If you ask him to absolutely take charge today in my thoughts and in my words and in my hands, you got to let the Holy Spirit take charge. And of course, get in the word and see the things God wants you to know. So we find Philip as we meet him here in the business of being a deacon. Now go over to Acts chapter 8 that we read tonight. In Acts chapter 8, God sent out missionaries all over the Middle East by force. What do I mean by that? He brought great persecution on the church at Jerusalem so that many people said, we're just going to get out of here and move to another city. You find that here in the first part of chapter number 8. And of course, in verse 4, when they went to other places, look what they did. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. 
Now, just because they were driven out of Jerusalem didn't mean these people were not going to share their faith. They kept on doing it. And of course, as we know from history and later on in the book of Acts, there was persecution in a lot of these other places they went to. People suffered persecution for sharing their faith and preaching the gospel back in the early church. But they were willing to do it. One of the people who did it, we find here in verse 5, was Philip. Philip, one of these deacons then, we find goes to the city of Samaria. Now, I don't have a map up here tonight of Israel, but if I did, Israel back in the first century was divided into three parts. Way up on the north part is what we call Galilee. Galilee was a north part of Israel. You put it just about divided into thirds. Right in the middle of Israel is this land called Samaria, and the capital of Samaria, the land, was called Samaria, the city itself. It was in the middle, and of course down at the bottom was Judea, where Jerusalem was located and so forth. Now if you know things about the first century, the Jews who were full-blooded Jews did not like the Samaritans. Why? Samaritans are what they termed half-breeds. Way back when the Assyrian army conquered all of the northern kingdom of Israel, when the kingdoms were split into two sections, the Assyrians moved a lot of their people into the northern kingdom, took a lot of the people out of the northern kingdom, and assimilated a lot of Gentile people amongst the Jews. Well, in the normal course of things, the Jewish people there married with the Samaritan, with the um, Assyrian people and others that were there, Gentiles, formed what we know as the Samaritan people. Poor-blooded, pure-blooded Jews did not like Samaritans, and the Samaritans also developed hatred for the Jews. They didn't like each other. In fact, if you were going to go from Galilee, from way down here in Judea, you would not go walk through Samaria. Over here at the edge of all three of these different sections of Israel was the Jordan River, basically the eastern boundary at that time of the nation. People in Judea would cross the Jordan River, go up on the other side of Israel, and come back into Galilee that way, rather than setting a foot in Samaria. Now that type of thing was still going on right here when we read about Philip going there. So number one, when you take a look at Philip, he had a full heart of love. He said, I don't care about these Samaritan people. They have souls too. I want to go there and minister to them. They need to be saved just like the Jews. And Philip, of course, was not going to stay home. He went right there, started preaching the gospel in Samaria. You know, folk, we need to remember that, that all types and walks of people in this life need the Lord Jesus Christ. Doesn't matter their race. Doesn't matter their social standing. Doesn't matter where in the world they're from. Absolutely everyone needs the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're commanded by Jesus himself in Mark 16, 15 to go into all the world and preach the gospel to some creatures. Is that what it says? No. To all creatures, all people need the gospel message. So... Philip knew that. He knew the great commission of Jesus. He knew the job of the church was to go everywhere. He goes into Samaria. And with that great big heart of love, we see how God uses him here. Notice in verse 6, it says, that, well, first of all, verse 5, he preached Christ unto them. Now, what about these Samaritan people? What did they believe? Well, they were very similar in their beliefs to the Jews. But because of their differences with the Jews, they would not go to Jerusalem to worship. They set up their own place of worship in Samaria. And that's where they went. 
but basically they were people as a whole who would follow Old Testament teachings and have a set of things just like the regular Jews did in their land. They just didn't go to the temple at Jerusalem and worship. They wouldn't do that. But nonetheless, they undoubtedly heard of Jesus. Jesus Christ, of course, went through their country. Was Jesus a respecter of persons? No, he was not. His main ministry for most of his three and a half years was up in Galilee. His headquarters was at Capernaum on the Sea of Galilee, and he did much of his ministry up there in that northern kingdom. But on occasions, he would go right through Samaria. Who's the famous person he met at a well and witnessed to her one-on-one? -on -one? The Samaritan woman in John chapter 4. Jesus was interested in Samaritans, and so definitely we find Philip following that example. And so he went and preached Christ. They knew who Jesus was, just like all the Jews would have known in the first century, heard of him, knew something about him, although most of them absolutely did not believe he was the Messiah, didn't want have anything to do with him. That was certainly the case when it came to most of the Jews. But the Holy Spirit worked on hearts, and so some got saved. But look at the results of his preaching in verse five, 6. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spoke, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. So here we find a great number of these Samaritan people living in the city, capital city of Samaria listened and accepted what Philip had to say. Now, because his message wasn't listen to the Bible, they did not have the Bible back then. All they had at this time was the Old Testament scriptures and, of course, what the apostles were teaching and beginning to give what became inspired scripture. So he couldn't just get up and say, look what the Bible says, like we can today. So God, in the first century, in order to confirm the message of these men of God, allowed them to work miracles. Of course, it mentions here that he cast out many that were possessed with unclean spirits or devils. A devil is when they, somebody asked me not too long ago, said, how do you know if somebody's demon possessed? If someone curses and swears a lot, if somebody looks really mean at you or somebody, is that a demon possessed person? Well, all I can say is we can't be 100% sure, but most demon-possessed people that are explained as to their behavior in the New Testament were pretty wild. That was the maniac of Gadara that ran around naked in a graveyard and was stronger than the chains they tried to put on him. I mean, superhuman strength. So, you know, he was very wild. Others, of course, the demons would come over people and cause them to have epileptic type seizures and some people would run through fire and just a lot of crazy things under demon possession. So, you know, uh, when it comes to demon possession, that's the type of thing that he was probably dealing with. And of course, here we find that he also healed people with palsies and he healed people who were lame. And of course, when these miracles are happening, people could see the power of God was upon Philip. And they gave heed to his message, and of course that led to many of them being saved. And in verse 8, when people get saved, what happens? There was great joy in that city. There's no joy like the joy that can come to your heart when you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Jesus came, according to John 15, to give us joy and wants our joy to be full. And in John 15, he says, the key thing to your joy being full is you abiding in me and me abiding in you. Listening to my words and abiding in them. That's a key thing to having joy. Read that passage sometime. But Jesus wants his people to have joy. And here, when these people accept the Lord, there is great joy. So Philip had a great ministry here. But Philip also was very sensitive to the Holy Spirit's leading. We need to be that way. You know, there's some people out there that 
have probably heard the gospel from other people, may have heard something on the television, read something in a pamphlet, but they've been uh, 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 awakened to the gospel message. And someone may just come along if we're prompted by the Holy Spirit and they're ready to receive Christ as Savior. I've had a few of those in my ministry. Philip is going to be one that has that type of experience too. Please notice, if you will, in verse 26, here we find him again. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went. Now, when the Holy Spirit's impressing upon you to do something, don't say no. That's quenching the Spirit. Quench not the Spirit, it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse number 16. We are supposed to listen to him. Follow the Holy Spirit's leading. Philip did that. It says, Arise, go down uh, the way that goeth from Jerusalem to Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went. Behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority, under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all the treasure, so the treasure of that country, had come to Jerusalem for to worship. Now, what was he worshiping? Well, undoubtedly, this particular man had converted to Judaism and went up to Jerusalem to worship there in that place. By the way, did you know there's a lot of Jews that live in Ethiopia today? As a matter of fact, it's kind of fascinating, but there's been a lot of reports that the Ark of the Covenant has been in Ethiopia. Supposedly, Israelis flew it back to Israel maybe 30 years ago. This private jet showed up there. Nobody knew what's going on and flew to Ethiopia and flew back. And so now it's supposed to be under lock and key by the people who are part of the Temple Institute. I talked about them on a Wednesday night getting ready to build the temple. Now, whether that's true or not, I do not know. Do you know the Ark of the Covenant's been gone ever since the Babylonian captivity? Whenever Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Jerusalem, the Ark of the Covenant was gone. So nobody's seen or heard from it. And it's not important to worship the Lord anymore. I suppose the Jews would not want to have a replica of it in the temple whenever they have the temple rebuilt for the tribulation time. But this is interesting. I saw a news report on this. A number of the churches now, churches down there in Ethiopia, have replicas in them of the Ark of the Covenant. They've made replicas, and they're in their churches. So some people say, well, for them to have those replicas down there, they must have had the real thing. I don't know. But nonetheless, there's a lot of Jewish worshipers in Ethiopia to this day. And so we find that maybe this man was a key to that. Anyway, he was worshiping in Jerusalem. But in verse 28, it says he was returning, sitting in his chariot, reading Isaiah the prophet. Good place for Jews to read. Especially if you can get them to read Isaiah 53. Because the things that are explained there about Jesus coming into the world are fulfilled in the New Testament. It has some great things to get their attention in Isaiah 53. So maybe he was reading there. Somewhere in Isaiah. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And the man was very honest about it. He said, How can I except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generations? For his life is taken from the earth. So notice here, he's reading in Isaiah, and the eunuch says here, I don't understand this. Is the prophet talking about himself? 
Or is he talking about someone else? Well, notice what verse 35 says. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Philip spoke to crowds in Samaria, but he also has led the Spirit to deal one-on-one -on -one with someone. And you know what, folk, I want to mention tonight, this one-on-one -on -one dealing with people is the most effective in our day and time. Reason, it's hard to get people who don't know the Lord to come to church. You invite them, invite them till you're blue in the face. It's hard to get them here. Now, sometimes we give little incentives like a friend day to bring your friends out. Those have been the most successful times to get people in the house of God when we have a friend day. Used to be people would come out some to revival services, but boy, anymore it's like pulling teeth. You can invite 50 people, and if one comes, you're doing good. I mean, they're just not interested. That's not something you do in this day and time. So the best way, and the way we're going to reach the most people is to go out there, be sensitive to the Spirit, strike up some conversations with folk, and just see if some will open up. Some people open up. Well, you know, I've been thinking about spiritual things. Well, do you know what the Bible says about going to heaven and all? And you can share the gospel message with them. Many of them will listen and be respective about it. Whether they trust the Lord or not is certainly between them and God. But you can definitely present the gospel message. And God wants us to do that. We need to be sensitive about the fact the Lord is interested in saving all people. And it never hurts to ask people as they come across your path and you have the opportunity. Do you know you're on your way to heaven for sure? Or if you died today, what would happen to you? Now, of course, most people say, well, I'm hoping I'm going to heaven. That's the word they use a lot of them say, hoping. And so ask them, well, how do you hope to get there? And of course, a lot of people say, well, number one answer of somebody that's been in church is, well, I was baptized. I was baptized. I was baptized. And of course, baptism is a wonderful thing, and all Christians need to be baptized, but it does not save you. Salvation is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. We have to repent of our sins and receive him as our personal savior to be saved. But a lot of people put a lot of stock in baptism. Well, there's something about here now as we read on about Philip that'll touch on that very subject. Notice here as he preached to him Jesus and told him all about who the prophet Isaiah is talking about, that Jesus is the one fulfilling all of this. It says they went on their way, they came to a certain water and the eunuch said, see, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Baptism's on his mind. Well, take a look carefully at what Philip said. Philip didn't say, all right, let's get down the water. He said in verse 37, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. Belief and reception of Jesus Christ comes first. It's the important thing. He would not have baptized this eunuch unless he confessed Jesus as his Savior. So know what the, uh, notice what the, Philip, oh, excuse me, the eunuch says in verse 37. He answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. What's John 3.16 say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the belief that saves. We must have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Over in the book of Romans chapter number 10, you know quite well, verse 9 and 10 says, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth uh, the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart. Remember here, Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you got to really mean it from your heart. Now, a lot of people, sure, I want Jesus, but they'll just pray with you or just, you know, interested sometimes to get you off of their back um, or say, yeah, I want a free ticket to heaven, so I'll pray or save Jesus. But they have no intentions 
of with their heart turning to him and turning from sin. They just don't have that. So you got to be careful in dealing with people. In fact, I just got an email from uh, Brother Andy Schultz, who is over in the country of Zambia. And he said, over there, there's a lot of easy prayerism and easy believism. He said, people will just so easily pray with you. You can meet a man on the street and say, do you want to accept Jesus? Sure, let's pray. And they'll pray and accept you. They don't even know what they're doing. So he said, he's had to take a lot of time to go back and explain to people what salvation is really all about. Why you need to be saved. Why you need the Lord in your life. He has to go back to step one and see people really be converted because a lot of them have misunderstood over there. So, if thou believest with all thine heart, you're saved. Then you can follow the Lord in baptism. And folk, that's the order in the New Testament. Once a person receives Jesus Christ as Savior, then they can and should be baptized. Not to be saved, not to keep saved, but baptism is a testimony. When you get in that baptistry, you are picturing the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the basis of your salvation. That's the gospel message. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, I deliver unto you the gospel, how that Christ died according to the scriptures and was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's the gospel. People have to believe that, and we're picturing that in the baptistry. Plus, we're picturing the fact that we have died in receiving Christ to the old life. We've been buried, and now we have risen to walk in newness of life with Jesus Christ. It's all a testimony. It's a picture to people watching you. I am taking my stand for Jesus Christ. That's what baptism is all about. There's hundreds of verses about being saved in the New Testament that have no baptism connected with them. Very few verses have baptism connected with them because you're saved by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ plus and minus nothing. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 say that. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works. Baptism is the first work you do to follow Christ. You decide to get in the baptism and be a testimony for him. But it's not the gift of God. That is the Lord Jesus Christ and receiving him as Savior. Well, Philip here commanded the chariot to stand still. They went down both of them into the water. By the way... You'll notice there's no sprinkling here. <laughs> if they were sprinkling, why in the world would they go down into the water? They had to go down the water because baptism in the New Testament is by immersion. Sprinkling didn't even happen until the 3rd century A.D. when there was a Catholic man named Novation who absolutely wanted to be baptized before he died but he was too sick to go to the water. So someone came up with the idea. Of course, they didn't sprinkle him. They just totally poured water all over him. And from that experience then, really the Roman Catholic Church started this. They started baptizing people by pouring water, then sprinkling water upon people. And then, of course, Cyril in Africa, another Roman Catholic bishop, had the brilliant idea I think we ought to baptize babies. We can sprinkle water on them, and then from the time they're born, they'll be Catholic. We can keep them in the Catholic Church by baptizing all babies. And so that's where sprinkling of infants came also in the 4th century A.D. No record of those things happening before that time. All, I'll tell you this, I have a book in my office. List Methodist theologians, Presbyterian theologians, Lutheran theologians, quotes by a whole bunch of their different theologians. They all uniformly together have to say the original method of baptism is by immersion. The word, of course, to baptize, baptizo in the Greek, means to dip or immerse in water. So why do we get away from it? Well, because men want to. Men want to do things different ways, and it's just so more convenient to sprinkle water than put somebody clear through a baptistry. 
And so men come up with these ideas, and so many churches do that. But here they went down the water, baptized him. Verse 39, when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, and the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But what does Philip finally do the last time we see him here in Scripture? But Philip was found at Azotus, passing through. He preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. He continues to spread the gospel. He had a heart for people. He loved people. They didn't have to be Jews. They could be this Ethiopian Gentile man who was converted to Judaism. I'll be happy to talk to him and reach him. He was interested in all people. You know, folk, that's the way we need to do. Don't shy away from someone because they look a little gruff. Don't shy away from someone because they're not your particular race. Don't shy away from someone just because they seem to be foul-mouthed. You know, the only way somebody's going to clean up their mouth is if they get saved. The Lord's got to get a hold of their heart and change them. So, you know, uh, you've got to minister to all people, witness to all people. The Lord wants us to. All people can and will be saved. But the key is, as we learn from him tonight, from Philip tonight, the key is we must have a heart for people. Do we? Are we just satisfied with being with me, myself, and I? My family? My friends? I know we have to get out of our comfort zone to meet people. But we need to do it. Because people need the Lord. And as I said, for the majority of the time, we have to try to meet people individually like Philip did here in this day and age. It's hard to get people to come to church. So we got to go to them and explain the gospel to them. And you might be surprised. You might run across someone sometime who absolutely, you know, is ready to receive Christ. Sometimes even by track. Years ago, in my first few years of pastoring this church, there was a lady named Penny McBride. Some of our folks still know her. She was a waitress at the Sea Merchant Restaurant was up there where there's a Mexican restaurant now in North Cunningham. A couple from Covington, Kentucky were passing through, ate their lunch there, left a track on that table. They went on. Penny McBride was their waitress. She got that track and read it, and the Lord spoke to her. So she wound up calling them. They had the number on the back there for themselves, calling them down in Kentucky, saying she read the track, was interested in more information. So that couple had a pastor in their church who happened to go to the school I went two years ago, Tennessee Temple in Chattanooga, Tennessee, so he called down to the university to see if they could find a pastor up here in Champaign-Urbana area. Well, they found me. So then I was able to contact Penny McBride, and was she ever ready to receive the Lord as her Savior? What a blessing that was from a track. But, of course, apparently she was convicted about her lifestyle, the way things were going in her life at the time anyway. So reading about the hope in the gospel got our attention just from leaving a track on the table. We try to do that, sometimes forget, but we try to leave tracks on table wherever we eat at restaurants. You never know who might be spoken to and might be saved. One way of witnessing is through gospel tracks. And we have them back there free for you to take and pass around. Some people leave them off in restrooms. You know, I've seen them in restrooms sometimes traveling. Somebody will leave a gospel track when you're going to use the restroom. There it is for somebody to pick up and read. And you never know what might happen with that. Great idea. I know that uh, the Taylors had a business in their home. And maybe they still do this. But they put tracks in their bills and things they sent out, you know. So people that get those get a track in them. That's a good policy too. A good policy. Someone in our church has mailed out tracts for years to just random addresses. That brought forth fruit for the first time I've ever recalled it just a few weeks ago when a man showed up here on Sunday night. And he said, 
somebody just randomly sent me a track with your church information on it. I decided to come to church and visit you. Paid off. You don't know how the Lord might be working if we will just be faithful folk to evangelize, to spread the gospel. Philip, a man who loved people, loved the Lord, loved people, wanted to share the gospel, and the Lord used him mightily in Samaria and beyond as he ministered to others. What about us? Are we willing to love people, be concerned for people, share the gospel with people? I trust we might just be renewed to that effort here tonight. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time around your word and being able to study about Philip the evangelist as we call him, a man who was chosen to be one of the first deacons, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, wanted to absolutely help in any way he can. And he started his ministry to widows there in the church at Jerusalem. When the church got persecuted, went from their Lord into Samaria, a very difficult place for a Jew to go. But he went and shared the gospel. You are with him, empowering him. And many people in Samaria there came to know the Lord through Philip's testimony. But he was sensitive to you to be led there in the wilderness and talk to an Ethiopian eunuch who was traveling in a chariot. And Lord, we need to be sensitive to you. If we meet somebody and we just feel that tug in our heart springs, you ought to speak to this person. You ought to speak to this person. Then Lord, help us to do that. They may be waiting for someone to explain to them the gospel message and be saved. Help us to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit like Philip was. Give us a love and concern for others. Time is running out and people need the Lord. So use us even this week as we go from here. In Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen. Appreciate your attention tonight. Shake hands with one another. Have a great week in the Lord. You're dismissed.